Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this plenary session titled Leadership, Finance and Accountability, focusing specifically on the question of how do we advance national food systems pathways. My name is Nozi Poshabalala and it is an absolute privilege and an absolute honor to serve you as the moderator of this plenary session. Please do um, accept our apologies for the late start. Um, we will try to the best of our ability to catch up on the time as much as possible. Now, before we start our session, I think it's important just to spend a minute to really contextualize the key focus of this particular plenary session. Just last year in 2021, we saw the African common position around the transformation of food systems. And we did this in pursuit of the 2030 agenda, but we also did this because of the shared belief that transformed food systems are integral for our efforts of alleviating poverty, and we cannot do without them in building inclusive and equitable societies. And so we saw that, that common African position translating into national policies, but also into continental and regional initiatives. And that all sounds good and well, except we find ourselves at an inflection point. And at this inflection point, we see that in the last two years, there's been a rise in the number, a steady rise in the number of people facing hunger and starvation. We also find that as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen millions more being pushed into poverty. Food systems and food system transformation is really fighting for attention on the economic and political agenda. And more importantly for this session, we're seeing fiscal and budgetary constraints from all angles. So the key questions that we want to tackle and address in this session are really how are we going to unlock public and private um, sector financing? Where are the innovative financing solutions going to come from? How do we bring in more accountability into the system? And from a leadership perspective, how do we ensure that we are tracking and monitoring so that promises made are promises kept? And so ladies and gentlemen, that is the framework for our session this afternoon. And we're going to hear from a range of our high level speakers, including a robust and dynamic panel discussion towards the end. We're going to start off uh, by hearing, of course, from, uh, the, from His Excellency, uh, the President of Zimbabwe, and to introduce His Excellency. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome onto the podium to, to introduce His Excellency Mnangagwa. I'm going to call on the Chair of the AGRF Group of Partners, as well as, of course, uh, the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, His Excellency Halimarian Desalian. Can we give him a big round of applause, please? Your Excellency, as you take your seat, I'm going to take you, ask you to release your seat, and I'm going to invite you to the podium to kindly share some of your opening remarks and to introduce His Excellency, um, the President of Zimbabwe. Over to you. Your Excellency, the President of Zimbabwe, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Agra's relationship with member states of Agra is growing from time to time. And AGRF has become one of the premium 
platform that deals with the current uh, situations we are in, where the crisis we are seeing now is monumental. And at this juncture, I would like to thank His Excellency to join us in this uh, very special moment in the history of the world. And now I call upon Your Excellency to give us your remarks to this audience gathering. Thank you, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, Helen Mariam Dessalem, Chairperson of the Africa Green Revolution Forum and Partners Group, distinguished guests present here, heads of United Nations agencies who may be here, Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm greatly privileged and honored to address you today at this opening plenary session of the African Green Revolution Forum on the theme Accelerating Food Systems in a time of crisis, which calls upon us to focus our attention and responsibility towards shaping pathways and solutions to the challenges that confront us as a continent in building resilient agricultural food systems. Agriculture remains by far the single most important economic activity on the continent and its value to the economic growth of African countries is immeasurable. Over half of the continent's inhabitants are subsistence farmers. In addition, Agriculture provides employment for two-thirds of the continent's working population and contributes on average between 30 to 60 percent of the continent's gross domestic product and about 30 percent of total exports. Agriculture is also a source of raw materials not only for African industries, but the world's major economies heavily depend on Africa for their industrial inputs. This typically exemplifies the importance of agriculture to Africa and beyond. Despite all its enumerated importance, African agriculture continues to face a myriad of challenges which threaten the sustainability of food systems and have the potential to leave the African continent vulnerable. Your Excellencies, climate change has become the single greatest threat to agricultural production and productivity on our continent. 
African countries continue to experience climate change induced disasters such as cyclones, floods, droughts, high temperatures and prolonged dry spells. In 2019, Zimbabwe suffered devastation from the effects of cyclone die, which destroyed infrastructure, killed many of our citizens, destroyed crops and livelihoods, and they killed our livestock. COP27, that is due to be hosted by Egypt in October this year, will give us yet another platform as African leaders to amplify the urgent need to address climate change. The geopolitical conflict between Russia and Ukraine has exacerbated a looming food crisis in Africa as a result of the rise in global prices of food, fuel, and fertilizer. This presents opportunities for the continent to be food secure while building resilience and sustainability on our own continent. This is Africa's present day challenge and our generation's obligation is to conquer it. Despite the challenges we face as a continent, solutions abound on the horizon. Climate proofing agriculture is an immediate solution to address the challenges from climate change. This can be achieved through the adoption of climate smart agriculture practices, such as conservation agriculture and irrigation development that help build adaptive capacity, enhance resilience, and increase agricultural production and productivity. In this regard, my government is now in the third year of implementing the smart agriculture practice of what we call Pumbudza in Tuasa, targeting smallholder farmers who contribute a bigger pie to Zimbabwe's agricultural produce. In Zimbabwe, we have cultivated a record 80,000 hectares of winter wheat, and we expect to produce over 400,000 metric tons of wheat against our national demand for 360,000 metric tons, which means we shall have surplus. For the upcoming summer season, we plan to cultivate 1.9 million hectares of maize, and we expect to produce 3.2 million tons of maize against a national requirement of 2.2 million metric tons, which means we shall have surplus. The importance of building capacity in agriculture sectors, despite frequent droughts, remains critical. Hence, Zimbabwe has embarked on extensive dam construction projects, with additional new dams being constructed in each of our country's 10 provinces. This will see a significant increase in the total hectares of land under irrigation. A fertilizer import substitution strategy is being implemented and is envisaged to help our quest to realize self-sufficiency in this respect. A further, to further augment and strengthen food systems, my government is also supporting the production of traditional grains, such as sorghum, millet, and the groundnuts. Concurrently, the promotion of the nutrition aspects of traditional grains has been given greater impetus and support by our First Lady of the Republic of Zimbabwe, Dr. Mnangagwa, of what she calls the cookout competitions 
which have become popular among women and the youth in the country. Additionally, traditional chiefs have begun to popularize the growing of traditional grains to promote food security and nutrition at the local level. Our continent must also take advantage of the African continental free trade area to fill shortages and supply gaps brought about by national shortages. The AFCFTA is an important framework for facilitating intra-Africa trade in this regard. It is regretted that Africa continues to import around 45 billion US dollars worth of food annually from outside the continent. It is my clarion call to all stakeholders in the food chain in Africa to work extra hard to ensure that the continent becomes self-sufficient in this area of economic endeavor. Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in order to develop, this, to, to develop and strengthen food systems in Africa, agriculture requires from us to enhance equitable livelihoods through reducing the gender disparity in the ownership of resources and the means of production between men and women. Statistics indicate that about 62% of labor in African agriculture is provided by our women. And they do the bulk of the work to produce, process, and market food. The continent's potential to grow and develop agriculture lies with the empowerment and the capacitation of our women and the youth. To put it boldly and bluntly, there can be no success in agriculture without the participation and the empowerment of women. <laughs> the majority of us will recall that in 2014, the African continent concluded and signed the Malabo Declaration, which committed to accelerate agricultural growth and transformation for shared prosperity and improved livelihoods by 2025 as part of the roadmap to fulfill the African Union Agenda 2063. This was followed by the commitments to achieving sustainable development goals, SDGs, by 2030 in 2015. These commitments should give us greater impetus as a continent to harmonize our efforts, share our experiences, and come up with joint solutions and ensure no country and no place on the continent is left behind. In conclusion, I wish us all fruitful deliberations and exchanges that will enable us to come up with solutions to sustainably develop African agriculture and to be able to address the challenges that confront us, such as climate shocks, pandemics, and geopolitical conflicts, either in our region or beyond our region. It is imperative that we take advantage of this forum to further strengthen and consolidate regional economic ties between ourselves. I wish you fruitful deliberations during the course of this summit. Thank you for your kind attention. I thank you. It's a very big thank you to His Excellency President Mnangawa from, uh, the, of course, President of Zimbabwe. Thank you for your opening remarks, Your Excellency, reminding us, of course, of the geopolitical landscape and how that translates into some of the national policies we should be seeing.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure now to ask us to turn our attention to the screens as we hear from His Excellency Lazarus Chakwera, the President of Malawi. Your Excellency President Paul Kagame, President of Rwanda, and host of the Africa Green Revolution Forum. Your Excellency Emerson Mnangagwa, President of Zimbabwe. Your Excellency Mohamed Bazoum, President of Niger. Your Excellency Prime Minister of Tanzania. Ladies and gentlemen, the sustainability of agricultural production and industrialization in Africa has never been more important than it is now. Recent geopolitical events that have disrupted the food supply chain between Europe and Africa have ripped the band-aid off the wound of complacency that we as Africans have been nursing for decades. We must now accept the harsh reality that we as African leaders have allowed our continent to be at the mercy of foreign systems, even in areas where we ought to be leading the world, areas like food production. We must now change this dynamic and take our rightful place at the table of nations as the feeder of the world. It is simply unacceptable that millions in Africa, a continent with more fertile land, fresh water, and farmers than any other are on the brink of starvation because we expect Ukraine to send us food. This AGRF summit, therefore, comes at a critical time and we must put it to good use. For our part, following the Food Systems Summit last year, Malawi undertook a nationwide multi-stakeholder dialogue process to identify policy and implementation gaps and agree on game-changing propositions to trigger structural transformation for the entire food system. As a result, we identified catalysts to lead the transformation of the food systems in Malawi, including policy coherence, infrastructure development like roads, processing and storage facilities, diversification of diets, equitable access and control of productive resources like land and water, changing consumer trends and the digitization of the agricultural sector. Our focus now is turning these priority aspirations into actions. In line with this focus, the reason I'm not able to join you in person for this summit is that I am presently hosting a national investment summit that is seized of these very matters of agro-production and agro-industrialization. The summit has drawn together dozens of local and international private sector players to agree on the action plan we need to implement with the private sector to achieve food security and cement commercial agro-industrialization as the engine for making our economy resilient to external, environmental, and geopolitical shocks going forward. But we know that making any actions we each make within our nation sustainable depends on our ability to work together as African nations to increase agricultural trade among ourselves. This is why we are grateful, Your Excellency President Kagame, for hosting this summit to consolidate the partnerships we need to enhance among ourselves. And I'm happy 
to inform you that we are putting your hospitality to full use by putting our investment plans on display there in Kigali in the Malawi deal room. And I invite you all to spare a moment to visit us and appreciate what we have on offer. Thank you for listening. We've allowed ourselves to be at the mercy of other nations, even in places and areas where we should be leading. That's a big thank you to uh, President Chakwera, President of Malawi, as he rounds up uh, those um, framing and introductory remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now getting ourselves ready for our keynote remark, and it's my absolute honor to welcome the Right Honorable Tony Blair, Executive Chairman of the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It's an enormous pleasure uh, to, be, to be with you here today. I'd like to give a, a great shout out actually as well to President uh, Agnes Kalabata, President of Agra, who does so much work for agriculture all over the continent of Africa. Thanks so much for your leadership, Agnes. It means a lot to everyone. Um, So, I mean, the, the hour is late. Um, I thought I was going to be the warm-up act for Didier Drogba, actually, but I don't know that Didier is here. In any event, I haven't forgotten or forgiven that goal he scored against Newcastle, my team, uh, for Marseille back in 2004. Um, so, look, I'm going to just make a few brief points. We, we didn't have this conference in, in, in person for a time, obviously because of COVID. But one of the interesting things that happened during COVID is that because of the magnitude of the crisis, governments came together, systems worked together, governments did things that in normal times they would never have been able to do. And the big challenge that faces governments is how to take what they can do because they have to do it at moments of crisis and do it in the normal times. Because the crisis that we have around agriculture in Africa is not new. Yes, the conflict in Ukraine has exacerbated the situation, but it hasn't caused the problem. It's exposed the problem. The problem's been there for a long time. And the question is whether we can now find the will and the means to deal with it as if it was a crisis like the crisis the global community had to deal with in COVID. Now, one of the great things that AGRA is doing is it's saying if we want to deal with agriculture, we should have what's called a food system approach. In other words, what we're do dealing with is the whole, the whole gamut of issues that come to bear upon this problem. Issues not just to do with food itself and with agriculture, but to do with water, with energy, with climate. And what this requires are several things, and I just want to list them briefly. First of all, governments have got to work together within those governments. One of the biggest problems you have is that a problem of food and food production and agriculture is not just a problem for the agriculture minister. It's a problem for many different ministries because you need, the, you need the infrastructure, you need the power, you need the ports, you need to devise sector strategies that work coherently and it's got to be led from the top. The hardest thing about government, which is why my institute works in roughly 20 countries now across Africa and over 30 across the world, the toughest thing about government, as any of the ministers here know, is getting anything done. You know, I thought when I first came into Downing Street all those years ago, I sat around the cabinet table, I was prime minister. I thought because I was the most powerful person in the country, well, apart from the queen, of course, um, most powerful person in the country, I thought if I gave an instruction, something happened. What you realize over time is that nothing happens unless you get the whole of the government mobilized, unless you focus on implementation. So that's the first thing, what governments have got to do within government. Secondly, though, 
The President of Zimbabwe made a very important point a moment ago. We have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It's a, it's a massive thing. The World Bank estimates that by 2035, we could increase the amount of GDP in the continent of Africa by $450 million if we manage to apply the principles of that agreement properly. It is crazy that we have restrictions on agricultural goods shifting across frontiers within Africa. It's not just about finding markets outside, it's finding markets inside. We need to focus on agro-processing. Much of the work we do in countries, you discover countries producing raw materials. It could be cotton, it could be cashew, it could be any number of different things. And yet the finished product is made somewhere else. So the com commodities are exported raw, the value is added elsewhere, and often they find their way back into the country. The value having been gained by someone else. Technology. Right? Technology is changing everything. If you think about the possibilities of having a data system that can capture everything to do with an agricultural system, someone just gave me an example before I came in this hall. If you're a small farmer, often it's hard to get access to credit because you've got nothing that proves what you've produced, what you've made, and that you've got a viable business. If you collect the data, and if you enable that small holder to have a, an actual personal identifier that collects all their records and shows exactly what they've done, then you've got the possibility of accessing lines of credit. Irrigation, better use of water, additional crop yields, financial payments, if you're able to make financial payments, for example, subsidy payments for things like fertilizer, direct from government to farmer, you cut out the middle person, you cut out of a lot of corruption, does a lot of good for the world. And finally, education. There's nothing more important because education matters not just in terms of teaching young people the basics of literacy and numeracy, but education also in enabling farmers to know of best practice, to be able to combine together, making sure that markets function effectively, knowing how those markets have functioned. And finally, of course, sharing the best practice. One of the things that this conference is supposed to do is to bring people together, not just for a, a networking opportunity, but because when people come together, they can learn from best practice. I mean, if you're struggling within a ministry, trying to work out an answer to a problem, believe me, someone somewhere in the world is doing it. And so it's also important that we, we use conferences like this to share that best practice, the examples of what works and what doesn't. I believe the, the 2020s have got to be a decade of transformation. What speaker after speaker has said here today is that the current situation is unacceptable. And it is. Africa is a rich continent with too many poor people. Many of them are farmers. We know what we have to do. When we identify the problems we have to overcome, they're not hard to discern. It's not hard to know what to do. It is hard to do it, but doing it requires focus and will, attention to detail, determination that the job will be done. I believe that over this coming decade, there can be fundamental changes made in the agriculture of Africa, which can rid us of the absurdity of this continent importing essential foodstuffs. Africa should be a great hub of export for the world. It should be feeding the world. It can do. I do believe the political will there is today, present, in a way that it wasn't before. But we've got an immense amount of work to do. So if this present crisis that we describe has done anything, it should be to focus us on the urgency of the situation. We've let it lie for too long. We've got the means within our hands to do something about it. And for those of us from the outside, 
It would also help if we could get the international community partners, leave aside the bureaucracy, just get the support going to where it's needed. Make sure that the funds that are coming into development aren't tied up for months and sometimes years for people trying to access them, but they come based on what the countries themselves know they need in order to prosper. This is possible. It can be done, and with goodwill, it will be done. From my institute, that has got a great partnership with AGRA. We're going to work 100% with you to try and make it happen. Thank you very, very much for listening to me. It's been a great pleasure to come once again to the wonderful Kigali and see Rwanda and see all of you. <clears throat> many, many thanks, and good luck for the whole of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tony Blair. Ladies and gentlemen, it is difficult to get the job done, but the job can be done with focus and will and a whole of government approach. If the 2020s are going to be the decade of transformation, are we ready to do what needs to get done? A very big thank you to you, sir, for those keynote remarks. A final round of applause, please. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite two speakers onto the stage with me right now. They are going to be taking to the podium one at a time, and they're really speaking to the question of how are we doing? In pursuit of getting the job done, uh, we need to, of course, track and monitor and use opportunities such as these to pause and reflect on the question of are we moving in the right direction? And so speaking to championing and advancing African national pathways, I'm going to invite Mr. Martin Buala, the Agriculture Director at the Knowledge Management and Program Evaluation at AUDA NEPAD. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes up. Thank you very much, sir. You're going to be our very first speaker, so you could uh, take your position at the podium. And straight after, and I'm going to ask our next speaker to join me on stage right now, we're going to hear on the topic of food system indicators and monitoring progress on the Malabo Declaration. And from this, um, on this topic, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Godfrey Bahigwa. He is the Director of Agriculture and Rural Development at the AUC. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Over to you, sir. Thank you and good afternoon, your excellences and uh, standing on the existing protocol, actually recognizing everybody in the room. My presentation is actually going to be brief and is very much around where the rubber hits the tarmac. And uh, what is happening at the moment is that we are moving out of the process of the UN food systems and the countries continue to ask what next. And this is very much not about the list of priorities. This is about how do we get the action, how do we get the implementation, and how do we get organized, especially in terms of systemic capacity to walk the talk on what we have identified as priorities. This is informed by a lot of work that has happened, successes, challenges over the years in terms of CADAP implementation, and therefore is also about building on the gains, on the lessons we've gained out of CADAP. As you would see in the slide, it's about looking at the imperatives and what is compelling in terms of why should we be moving ahead and ahead faster than where we are. Sorry, I was... Yeah. And uh, indeed, I want to, like I said, go quite quickly. There's uh, a few slides that will be uh, circulated, so I will not uh, elaborate too much. But the first thing we've considered is to say, what is the issue? What are the issues? And when you look at that, and actually also picking up on the outcomes of the national dialogues, uh, what was identified was actually very much similar in terms of thematic issues, very much similar to what you find in the SDG, very much similar to what you find in Agenda 23, 
and quite actually complementary to what is in the CADAP Malabo seven goals that we have. And therefore, the issue was then what would be the value of just another list? And many of the countries actually were hesitant in terms of going in a process that is just about another list. And therefore, the issue and looking at all those matters, we were looking at what then should be new or different this time. Is it about doing just more of the same thing? Or what should we be, need to be doing differently and, in fact, boldly, radically different this time around? And therefore, this is also what you see when you look at the outcomes of the common position, uh, Africa common position and food system, was actually to identify a central running issue. What was the thing that was actually drawing energy, drawing attention, getting us to sit up, and actually one thing that cuts across all the national dialogues, including what came out of the, the uh, independent dialogues, but also what countries have been talking about in Malabo, Kadap uh, Malabo, and uh, indeed in Agenda 23, is actually the focus on the issue of uh, reducing or zero hunger. We have a goal in, uh, in uh, Kadap Malabo, there's actually uh, goal number two in SDG, and this is central. And actually, as has been mentioned by our principal speaking area, food systems and food security is more than just food in the stomach. It's about health, it's about education, it's about jobs, entrepreneurship in terms of income, uh, and indeed it's about uh, strengthening the public fiscus uh, and ability then of government to deliver public services. And we're looking at as the running point in terms of where do we start and how do we move. And uh, therefore, in terms of uh, uh, what do we do and what we have already, you can see in there what is already available. And therefore, what we are saying in this slide is that when you look at all the issues raised, the underlining issue is the bottom part there, how do we strengthen capacity? And this is what the process is about and I'll go straight to that slide as my last slide, is to look at we have identified and defined a process that will allow us to engage and support member states to operationalize what they have identified in the food systems pathway. And actually this is moving from the idea, from the issue into bankable, into business cases that are implementable and at the same time looking at how to enhance actual capacity to implement both in terms of public-private branded actions, but also involving uh, sub-national institutions, players uh, at all levels, and at the same time connecting with regional and continental efforts in realizing that success. So this is, as I said, we have details that will be available and working together with the African Union Commission and the regional economic communities, actually will manage a process that will respond to the countries. We already have a number of countries that have made requests, and I can confirm Zimbabwe is one of them, and we're actually now at the spot where we can engage and provide uh, the collaborative support, ensured in coordinated effort, systems that we can track in terms of measurement of progress and performance, as well as ensuring that all of us uh, uh, from every angle are actually engaging in the manner that is uh, systematic, that is coherent, and that is harmonized under the leadership of the countries themselves. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bailoa, for um, outlining the process uh, that is available uh, to countries, but also reminding us that where there's a process, uh, it is a how-to. And more importantly, it's that how-to that informs then the milestones that we then track and monitor progress against. Thank you very much for that. And so to our second presentation, let me now call on Dr. Godfrey Bahigua to take to the podium as he speaks on food systems indicators and monitoring progress on the Malabo Declaration. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh the moderator. Um, at the beginning of the session, you made uh, an interesting statement that promises made 
promises kept. And that is at the heart of mutual accountability, uh, which is the subject that I'm going to briefly talk about. Because of the brevity of time that I have been given, let me start at the end and give the message that I want to, to give. Um, when the African Union member states adopted the common position to the UN Food System Summit in July last year, they said they would like to track the, the progress in implementing the commitments or the pathways through an existing framework on the continent. And that framework is the CADAP Biennial Review Framework. It has 47 indicators that we track and report every two years to the heads of state. You had President Mnangagwa earlier talking about the Malabo Declaration with commitments up to 2025. Those 47 commitments have been mapped by our experts against the seven, the five action tracks in the food systems. And we have established that the, Mal the Malabo Banyo Review Mechanism is adequate to track the progress in implementation of the pathways in the food systems. If you don't hear anything else, that is the message you should go with. Yes, so we have been um, tracking the Malabo Declaration uh, for the last uh, six years. We just presented the third biannual review report to the Assembly in February. The last one is due January 2026 to mark the end of the 15, the 10-year period of the Malabo Declaration. These are the seven commitments that we track in the Malabo Declaration. Uh, my colleague Martin mentioned a few of them. And this is the process I, I just mentioned that we have uh, done three cycles so far. And we have indicators across the seven commitments. From that review process, what we produce is what is called the Africa Continental, the Africa Agricultural Transformation Scorecard. We give each country a score out of 10. And you can see on the screen that for 2021, only one country was on track to achieve the CADAP Malabo Declaration, and that is the country where we are today, uh, Rwanda. <clears throat> the countries that are in, in blue are countries that, are, that we classify as making progress because they are above the 50% mark towards achieving the Malabo Declaration, and there are 20 of them. Those in red still have a lot of work to do. So that is the outcome of the Banyo review process that we use to track the implementation of the uh, Malabo Declaration. I already mentioned the number of indicators that we track. Um, I have already mentioned the five action, plan, uh, action tracks in the food systems. And here is the slide that I wanted to spend a few seconds on. So what we have done, like I said, we have uh, taken the uh, 47 Malabo indicators and mapped them against the five action tracks. And you can see they map out quite well and the system is robust enough to um, track the implementation of the uh, food systems. However, we are also saying that should there be need, we are willing to look into those areas that are in the pathways of the food systems and develop new indicators and incorporate them within the biannual review mechanism. It is not necessary to develop a new monitoring mechanism. We use the existing mechanism and can adjust to fit any additional indicators to track the implementation of the food systems pathways. I thank you for your kind attention.
Thank you very much, Dr. Bahigwa. And ladies and gentlemen, as Dr. Bahigwa, as well as Mr. Bailua, make their way off stage. Can we give them a final round of applause, please? Thank you very much. I did want to lift, um, of course, that uh, the power of seeing a scorecard, especially a color-coded scorecard, really reminds us of, uh, one, the progress that we still need to make. It gives us an opportunity to celebrate those that are making progress, but also to bring uh, much-needed positive momentum to encourage each other to keep moving forward. It is what I would describe as positive peer pressure, if we will. So beautifully articulated. Thank you very much, sir. What I do understand is that both these presentations are going to be made available on the app. Um, you might have noticed that um, our speakers were really concise and to the point. And so if you're looking for the detail, the presentations are going to be circulated. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we get to our panel discussion, we do have an opportunity to shine a spotlight and to showcase some country progress. I'm going to invite three speakers onto the stage. They each are going to uh, share with us progress made in country. Um, with regards to developing national pathways. So I'm going to start off with the Honorable Owusi uh, Akoto, Minister for Food and Agriculture from Ghana. Let's give the Minister a round of applause as he comes up. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I'm also going to invite the Honorable Mark uh, Katonga Piri. Um, thank you very much, Your Excellency, who is, of course, the Minister of Industry and Trade from Malawi. Can we give him a round of applause, please? And we're going to round it off by inviting Mr. Jean-Claude Musabiyama, the Permanent Secretary at Minagri. Please can we give him a round of applause as well. Thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over to uh, Honorable Lakoto uh, first um, to uh, give us an in-country progress um, in terms of national pathways in Ghana. And Your Excellency, we've got um, about five minutes on the clock. And so over to you for you to just appraise us um, in terms of uh, progress in Ghana. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Ghana's path to transformation of its agriculture started uh, at the beginning of 2017 uh, when the government was voted into office. And there are a group of policies that we have labeled planting for food and jobs, which come into five modules. The first is for food security that we've heard so much about this today. The second is to do with tree crop authority, which is to plant trees as a forestation and trees which have economic value, uh, along with cocoa, to diversify out of our cocoa industry. And the third is to do with the uh, production of vegetables in greenhouses with high tech uh, amongst the youth of the country. The last but not the least is, of course, livestock to feed protein to our, our population and any extra to be exported. And the last is to mechanize agriculture on small holdings. All these five modules are focused on small holdings because Ghana produces 90% of our output, of agricultural output, is still produced by small holders. And therefore, we focused on that. And as far as the food security is concerned, in terms of grains and so on, we have had a period of four, four years of subsidy of fertilizer and improved seeds to encourage productivity increases. And that has worked, worked wonders for us because whilst our neighbors in West Africa are short of food, Ghana has become a food basket where you go to the savannah areas and the transition areas, you meet all kinds of trucks with number plates from all around West Africa, Nigeria, Mali, Burkina Faso, Togo, um, and, 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 and every country you can conceive of, they, because there's surplus food in Ghana, they come uh, and take the surpluses to their countries. And the fact of the matter is, if you look at the way, uh, for instance, specific areas like maize, Ghana never, never used to produce more than 2 million metric tons of maize. Last year, we did 3.5 million metric tons. Which, uh, which really shows you exactly the kind of success we have. And not only that, in the eye of the storm of the COVID, 
agriculture grew by 7.4% in 20, uh, uh, 2020. And last year, it went up to 8.4% growth in agriculture. And all this is not uh, rosy because we have serious challenges. Now that on-farm is working, we see that the constraints, and this is of great uh, uh, benefit for as a lesson to the food systems that we are talking about. We have two major challenges. One is to do with agro-processing. The new opportunities that have arisen in the Ghanaian agriculture is not being, is people are taking, the investors are taking a much longer time to realize that there is these opportunities for agro-processing. Rice, for instance, ma rice milling capacity in Ghana is only 450,000 metric tons. Last year, we produced 1.2 me uh, million metric tons. So there's a huge gap that needs to be filled with private sector investment in these areas. And the other uh, uh, challenge is to do with agricultural credit. Agricultural credit is woefully inadequate. Farmers, agro-processors are crying for credit in order to continue with the transformation and it's not coming. So we're talking to the bankers. We are looking at the possibility of legislating to ensure that the 3.1% of credit which goes into agriculture, more than half of which is for cocoa buying, is, is not enough and the, uh, the, uh, the, the banking sector will have to look at it. So these have implications for the food systems. In the last two years, uh, 18 months, we have a special program uh, to bring into focus, uh, realign with the food systems that the UN has adopted and the African uh, countries have a, a common position. We are trying to realign our programs so that we all move forward in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And I think the message to the investors and um, to uh, creditors is loud and clear. And that is uh, Ghana is ripe with agro-processing opportunities and also to the creditors that we need to reimagine uh, the approach and the framework to lending so that we are really uh, being part of the solution and unlocking opportunity rather than constraining it. Thank you very much uh, for that. Honorable um, uh, Kat uh, Katonga Piri, allow me to, to, to hand over to you and give you an opportunity to give us a, a country progress on Malawi. No, thank you so much. Um, after my head of state has analyzed you know, the policy direction of Malawi in terms of food security, I think we have to go to the technical side of how we are doing it. And for that, may I call upon an, an expert in the agriculture uh, ministry, Mr. Redwell Musopore, to an analyze the technicalities of how we are moving forward. Policy issues, that's where I belong has already been covered by my head of state. Mr. Musopore, I think you must be sitting somewhere within here. Can you come forward to analyze the technicalities on the technical part of what we are doing in Malawi? Mr. Musopore. Ladies and gentlemen, we can give him a round of applause just to welcome him. And you can have um, a seat on the side, sir. Thank you for um, a beautiful transition of handing over the baton to, to, um, to, to the good sir next to me. So the, the question really being, given that we've got the policy framework, perhaps you can talk to us from a technical perspective on some of the progress that we're seeing in Malawi. And once again, we've got about five minutes to listen in on the progress in Malawi. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, um, Excellences. Uh, Honorable Minister, uh, I'll build really on what uh, the Honorable Minister has touched on. Um, in terms of progress that uh, the country has registered, uh, basically we have come up with a, uh, a roadmap uh, in terms of how we move forward uh, given the adoption of the citizen report as well as the uh, pathways uh, and indeed the commitments that uh, the Honorable Minister as well as His Excellency made at the last year's uh, summit uh, in New York. Uh, number one, I would say that uh, the roadmap that uh, has been put up uh, consists of uh, four main areas. And the first one is to uh, provide space
for the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, who happened to be the National Dialogue Convener, to take the um, action plan and need the commitments to the minister colleagues. I think it has been mentioned here that uh, the discussion on food systems is not in the domain of Minister of Agriculture alone. And so this is um, supposed to, it's going to be done uh, within uh, the next uh, one month. The second um, aspect is to then take this to the technocrats within the line ministries. And the business there is again to provide detail uh, in terms of what the challenges, um, of the challenges that were identified, um, the priorities that we are supposed to um, undertake in the uh, short term as well as the um, medium term. And uh, what we envisage uh, to happen in there is that the line ministries are going to uh, bring together stakeholders in the subsectors and analyze what has already happened, what is happening right now, where are the gaps, and uh, how can we uh, move forward. Now, out of that uh, consultation process within the line ministries, we're going to have the uh, national uh, validation, um, if you like, you know, uh, session. And uh, in this session, we're going to invite everyone, especially those that participated in the uh, dialogue process, uh, so that uh, they can input and enrich uh, this work. And, and so we uh, adopt the agenda at the um, country uh, level. The last stage that we envisage is to take this outcome at the national level to uh, ground level structures, the district councils, because we realize that at the national stage, um, the, it, it is where um, the strategies are put together. That's where um, the policies are being you know, uh, put up. But in terms of action, it's going to be done at the grassroots level, at the district council level. And so the product of the national consultation, we envisage that um, it's going to be inputted into both the national uh, planning processes um, so that uh, whatever are realized as the gaps, they are being attended to in the national planning uh, cycles to uh, attend to the issues that have been isolated as being the um, gaps. Similarly, at the district council level, uh, we know uh, that uh, they also work on their district development plans and they also have annual planning cycles. So to what extent are, go are they going to be uh, inputting into those uh, plans at the council level, uh, especially that there is diversity uh, in the different district councils. And, and so the food systems story, they vary across the district councils. So we would like to have these inputted into their uh, planning processes. The other thing that we have noted um, is, is that there is quite a lot of interest uh, from the stakeholders, the non-state actors, the development partners. The question is, where are we at the moment? And most of them, they have uh, already been consulting the ministry on how they can begin to align their current programming as well as the, the new investments uh, to the identified priorities. So that's a stage where we are. Our total um, uh, outline of our, pro our plan is that by November, we should be uh, completed and begin to work on the uh, priorities. Yeah. And let me also hasten to indicate that we have the facilitation support uh, also from um, our partners. Agra is one of them uh, through the technical uh, um, arms. And they were going to be working on uh, the investment um, plans as well as the action plan, translating these commitments into action going forward. So let me stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an excellent update. And I think the Honorable Minister, um, uh, thank you very much uh, for that um, uh,
intervention there. But really interesting to listen to the priorities of the roadmap, how you're engaging stakeholders at the different subsectors, and how you're using uh, the, the, the national program to begin to identify gaps and to close gaps, and constantly looking to iterate the, the action plan and to improve around it. And then to close us off, allow me then to go to um, um, Honorable Permanent Secretary, uh, Mr. Jean-Claude uh, Musabiyama, to give us the update on where are we in terms of Rwanda. Of course, we did see the scoreboard was, was green, um, but I'm, I'm certain that you have uh, some, in, um, some progress updates that you'd like to share with us as well in five minutes. Thank you, moderator. And um, the question was to, to know about the progress of Rwanda on toward the, the, the pathways defined um, during the UN Food Systems Dialogues and where Rwanda is with the implementation of the pathways uh, defined. Uh, first of all, where we are, we are, we are advanced, if I can say. And um, during the last year, when you we were preparing the UN, food, uh, the UN Summit on the Food Systems, we went through three steps, and now we are the, on the, the third step. The step number one was about the national dialogues. We, have, we went through that, we convened a series of uh, national dialogues, and we brought together all the stakeholders, including academia, DPs, farmers, professional bodies, and uh, we, we, we defined, um, we, together we discussed what is uh, uh, what are the constraints, and uh, together we find the, 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 the solutions to the constraints of the sustainability of, of our food systems. The report was published, it was validated, and published. Then we went to the pathways and game-changing priorities, where we did with experts in the domain to define, just to go through the results of the dialogues in order to, to, to group and prioritize around key priorities that you have, and this we, we, and we came up with the pathways and game-changing priorities. The report was validate, validated and yet to be uh, published. Now we are on the step number three, where we are um, on the um, food systems implementation strategy and implementation plan, where we want to define actionable pragmatic set of investment areas with the game-changing priorities which will catalyze the food system's uh, transformation. Um, this is uh, how we, we, this is the result of the discussions we had and even the, the, the analysis that has been, been done uh, toward just the, the, our food, food system transformation and where we defined six game-changing solutions. Number one is the, about the, food, the, nutrition, the, the nutritious food programs. The second one was about to reduce food, lo food losses and waste management. The third one was to, to toward inclusive markets and food value chains. The fourth one was the sustainable and resi resilient food production systems. The fifth one was the inclusive financing and innovative investments. And the, the last, not the least, is effective mainstreaming of youth and women uh, in food systems. After that, where we are, we are there. This, um, we defined also the implementation model, and we, we have defined indicative priorities programs that are 14. And in order to implement, we opted to not create new structures, but to implement through existing uh, delivering mechanisms that you have in Rwanda, where we have national goals. That is our vision 2050 but also then with, for the food systems programs and the flagships has to be embedded and implemented through the sector strategic plans. We have now where we are is that we, we, have, we, we, we are discussing and defining our priority uh, pro projects and actions just to implement the pathways and you have some of them are listed uh, in the presentation in the last slide. Uh, those are these are a set of key uh, projects and uh, and um, and uh, programs that we, we already are defined that will help to address critical areas areas raised during the food systems dialogue 
and uh, uh, th th those include include to, to improve uh, to scale to scale up Africa, improve the food, fortify the whole grains, to improve to improve the school feeding programs, livestock programs. We have the Black Soldier Rav uh, Fly initiatives. We have the Agribusiness Hub. We have the beef produ production. We have crop intensification program. We have RNA technologies initiatives and others. And all those programs and others will be put together in order to have a, an investment plan to implement our pathways. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Permanent Secretary. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to wrap this conversation on the, uh, the country progress updates. But I do, just before I release all of my speakers, just want to highlight the significance of this conversation where we're really being deliberate and intentional about lifting the lid and answering the question, how are we doing? Uh, what are the processes in place? What framework are we using? Um, and I think it does respond to the question that was raised by um, Mr. Tony Blair to say, one of the things that this, um, this moment has to deliver on is how do we share best practice? And I think what we've done now is an example of exactly that. Can we please give um, our speakers a round of applause, please? Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as we, prefer, as we prepare now for our last um, sequence in the session, we're moving at breakneck speed and I'm hoping that you're all keeping up with the pace. As I call up my panelists, I'm going to uh, uh, invite Mr. Alvaro Lario. As he comes up, um, we can give him a round of applause, please. And you may take a seat closest to me here, right here, sir. Thank you very much. Mr. Larry, of course, is uh, president-elect of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or IFAD. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, Madam Gita Sethi, I know she's here. Let's give her a round of applause, please. Um, Madam Sethi is advisor and global lead for food systems at the World Bank. Thank you very much for being here. Mr. Roy Steiner, please, you're welcome. Let's give him a round of applause. Um, Senior Vice President at the Rockefeller Foundation, Mr. Ozonia Ogiello. Um, let's give Mr. Ogiello a round of applause. There he is. Thank you very much. And he is the resident coordinator for the United Nations here in Rwanda. And we're wrapping up this panel with Dr. Beth Dunford. I saw her earlier. There she is. Let's give her a round of applause, please. And she is the Vice President for Agriculture, Human and Social Development at the African Development Bank. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am mindful of time and unfortunately it means I'm going to put my panelists under immense pressure to do an even better job of what they had prepared to do by being concise and to the point. Um, and I'm going to literally go with a single question across um, to a different question to each of you, but it will be one question. And I'm hoping that in that question, you can really pack a punch in it with your response. So Mr. Lario, I'm, I'm going to start off with you. Um, one of the things that I think we all know is that farmers make up about 80% of the continent's food production. The broad question to you is, how do we reimagine investment and financing so that we can really unlock that um, 80%? And how is IFAD positioned to help in that endeavor? Over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Unfortunately, I, I need to leave just after my intervention, but. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. I'm very happy as the incoming president to join the coalition of doers, and I hope I'll show you through my, through my mandate. Um, it's clear from the interventions of many of the speakers that we do have the knowledge, we do have the institutions. What's lacking is the laser focus implementation, what's lacking is the financing, and what's lacking is the coordination. So the crisis, which we can talk about uh, for hours, has shown that something that IFAD actually has been putting on the table for many years. It has just exposed, as one of the speakers was saying before, what we know, an underinvestment for years in food systems, in agriculture, in terms of official development assistance, in terms of local governments, in terms of private sector. So from our side, um, we are stepping up. We have been evolving after the, over the last years. We have obtained a credit rating, which is a primer for a United Nations institution, not being a bank, which we will plan to also use to borrow money and also use it for the private sector, to blend instruments 
So we are planning to step up in private sector, we are planning to step up in terms of our gender transformative projects. And what's very clear is also on the side of climate financing. Climate is probably one of the biggest threats when the small farm holders actually are losing their land, are losing their biodiversity, soil, sea life. All of those are their assets, are their assets they live on and they're losing their livelihood. So climate will be also a very important part. At the institutional level, if I will continue focusing on medium term resilience, and I would just like to, to also um, mention that there's a, another meeting on financing common where we will be also having um, through a lot of our partners here, we will be leading on showing what 75 national, regional and public development banks have been doing in agriculture during the last year, during the crisis. It's going to happen in mid-October in Abidjan and that's part of thing what we need to show. Another important part is also leading with the World Bank on the financing of the food systems. What's the new food finance architecture going to look like? And I think that's going to be very key and I'm sure Gita will, will speak on it. And finally, what we're doing is also aligning our own country strategies to the national pathways, making sure that we measure how our programs are targeting and making sure that they speak to these national pathways. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lario. And I do understand that you have to leave, but if I can just take two more seconds of your time. Um, really encouraging to hear you talk about um, really being part of the coalition of doers, because I think that's been one of the underlying messages in the session, but also how the credit rating allows IFAD to really step up in its participation um, in, 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 as in, the, in the private sector. Now, I know because you have to leave, I'm going to do one more unfair thing. Um, and, th and that is this, some of my colleagues sitting at the back are working for media houses and they are looking for a headline about this summit that they're going to run on the 7, 8 p.m. news today. So you've got to give us a headline as, 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 a, a, as punishment for your sins of having to leave. And the headline starts with financing and you just need to complete the sentence. And remember, it's not the whole story, it's not the bulletin, it's just the headline. So what's the headline for the 8 p.m. news tonight? That's a very big one, I'll try. Um, so our focus on private sector needs to ensure that the partnerships and the investments are also benefiting the vulnerable and the poor rural people. So also how we implement and making sure that they are part of the solution including farmers' organizations, will be also very key. Okay, so I'm going to reword that to the media colleagues. Um, how we implement has to take into consideration the most vulnerable. I hope that's good enough for the news. Thank you very much, Mr. Lario. Let's give him a round of applause, please. And of course, we know we're running exceptionally late, so we do um, appreciate his participation. Madam Gita, let's, let's come to you. Um, I want to bring the pandemic into focus um, and we know that what it's done, it has really forced us to reimagine um, how do we go about financing resilience of, of food systems. I'm keen to hear how that conversation is going in the World Bank and how, what we might be expecting in terms of innovative financing that is geared towards resilience building. Uh, thank you very much. What a pleasure being here with thought leaders and action leaders. Thank you, Agnes, for your leadership. Um, before I answer that question, just stepping back, I think what is very critical is the food systems approach. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether we are addressing pandemics, we are addressing affordability of healthy diets, or we are addressing food and climate nexus. No? So with that in mind, so that's sort of the first uh, stylized fact. The second stylized fact is that the action has to be at the country level. Countries differ either because of their political, economic, socio conditions and also because of their agroecological conditions. But within that, there is a framework that we have adopted at the World Bank. Um, and it has, it's, a, it's three I's. Change incentives, accelerate innovation, and investments. Let me elaborate on, on each one of them very quickly. Incentives. We heard elements of it in the last two days already, very strongly. 640, 680 billion of public support to agriculture, in a way that's created a bankrupt planet and un unhealthy people. Clearly, incentives have to change, and there's enough evidence now that if we take even 1% of the 680 billion, 
which is 70 billion, the returns because of increased private finance, health bills, saving on the health bills because of improved health conditions, because of affordability of diet, etc., run in about two and a half trillion by 2040. So there's a huge business opportunity, but changing incentives has to drive it. Okay. The second is innovation. It, so what do, when incentives change, what, what, what does the repurpose public support need to do? And it's very true that countries are under investing in their prosperity. The, the difference in GDP, 50%, over 50% of difference in GDP across countries can be explained by productivity. And the reason productivity matters is the investments nations have made into innovation. And, and, and the returns are huge. And this is not a private sector response because of knowledge spillover. It is a pure, purely public sector, uh, public, global public good. And, and related, we heard all of this today, is about digi digital. Yeah. Farmers face multiple crises, and the beauty of digital is that none of these crises, constraints can become binding, whether it's uh, you know, uh, internet banking or it's mobile information, market prices, early warning systems, uh, 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 you know, soil health, uh, including the, the water, the content, and so on. So clearly, innovation is the second eye of investments. And the third is uh, the, the, of, of, of the overall transformation. And third is investments. World Benchmarking Alliance came out with a report. 350 largest multinational corporations in the food sector, which occupy, are responsible over 50% of revenues, and I'll be very quick. And their results are very sobering in terms of living income, living wages, in terms of impact on GHGs, in terms of uh, the, the, what they are putting on people's plate because they are so mm. catalytic and important to this transformation. So clearly, clearly private finance has to look very different. Yeah. And at the bank, uh, at the World Bank, we, for the next 15 months, we have put together a, a emergence or surge package of 30 billion, very much along these lines. The, the other revelation we have is ring fence investment lending is not, has not scaled up. So we are moving into a sector-wide approach and within the sector-wide approach, this, this financing framework. And, and that's, that's really our more of a system story irrespective of pandemic or making things uh, food mm. system more resilient. Sure, Geta, thank you very much. I think it's an excellent response not to only think about how do we do things differently, but giving us the focus, incentives, innovation and investment, and showing us and demonstrating at least what the World Bank is doing with this framework. And so as we look to private finance looking different, of course, we want to see the impact of that. So Roy, let me come to you with, with, with the next um, um, uh, question, if I can and do that. And I, I really, you know, looking at the Rockefeller Foundation and the many initiatives, perhaps we could shine a line on the food, a light on the food initiative. Um, and in particular, um, how is the work that you're doing on developing smarter and more regenerative procurement um, um, projects in, in country is really interesting. What is the link between thinking about procurement and how does that link to healthier food systems and more broadly just sharing with us around the impact of the food initiative at the foundation. Sure. Thank you. Uh, well, let me just start with a little bit of a sobering approach. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you look at productivity over the last 10, 15 years in, in Africa, uh, you know, the reality is we haven't made much progress. It's, it's actually really disappointing. And, and, and I think, uh, except for obviously some bright lights out there, and, uh, and, I, and I don't think we can make progress unless we face that reality. What we've been doing, if we keep doing what we've been doing, we're gonna get the same results. And I'd like to suggest that there's two things we, um, at, there's obviously many things, but two ideas. Um, the first is, you know, at the very beginning of, uh, you know, when we did this analysis, unless African governments in increase their investment in agriculture, we're not gonna get the transformation. Unless donors, the world does, doesn't improve, uh, increase its investment in agriculture, we're not gonna get the transformation we want. And, and when you look at the investment over time, it really hasn't been increasing. 
So we're going to get the same results because we're doing the same thing. There has to be much more prioritization on agriculture because of all the, we all know how important it is, um, but we're not making the changes we need to make. The second is the, uh, and it relates to your question and, and also so much of the theme here, is we have to take a food systems approach. Yeah. And one of the methodologies that I think is gaining a lot of traction uh, is a true cost accounting, a true value accounting. And when you, when you, when you do that, and we just did, you know, with, use, uh, with the help of our partners at McKinsey, uh, we did an analysis of the U.S. food system, and it turns out that, you know, we, it creates about a trillion dollars of value, but also creates two trillion dollars of costs. So we've created a food system that actually destroys economic value because we don't take a food system approach. We don't understand all the linkages and the, and, the, and, and the way the system reinforces or increases or de decreases value. So I think we need a whole transformation in the way we approach things. And, um, and I think we have tools to do that now. So that's, and, when, and then I'll, I'll end with, you know, this is where like the procurement is so important yeah. because if you can, you know, we, we did this analysis of school feeding and everybody thinks of school feeding as a cost but actually it creates tremendous value from a societal point of view because of the health benefits, environmental benefits, et cetera, especially if you do it in a way uh, that emphasizes regenerative uh, agriculture. So I'll stop there. I know we're, yeah. we're under time. Roy, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sobering thought, but such an important one to go back to the, to the question of productivity and how do we make sure that we're getting the most bang out of every buck that we're putting behind uh, food systems transformation. And so thank you for bringing that into the room because we need to also address leaking buckets if that is what, part of the reality of what we're trying to solve. So let me go to Mr. Ogiello, um, and I'm, 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 I'm keen to see your face, so you'll see me leaning right forward <laughs> quite a little bit. Um, I want to bring accountability into the conversation. Um, and in particular, we know that um, it's, as we reimagine investment and reimagine financing, We've also got to reimagine how do we hold ourselves more accountable and in a more effective way. From your um, position um, as resident coordinator and with the ability to lift some best practice around the world uh, when it comes to accountability, how might we do a better job when it comes to food systems and more accountability in the system? Thank you. Would you allow me to start by perhaps also suggesting two headline news items for your colleagues at the back? <laughs> Absolutely. I hope, hope by the media houses you're ready. We've yeah. got two headlines. So you've got one uh, for the 9.30 bulletin and one for tomorrow morning. So let's go for it. Thank you. I actually have two. So the first is that a lot of private capital in Africa is dead capital. So a lot of us are building prestige projects, prestige houses, in our communities, in our villages, and we are afraid to take a leap in the unknown world of business and experimenting and investing, whether it's in startups or young businesses. So you invest your money in areas you consider safe. And the safest investment for most of us is just uh, housing, you know, personal houses, block of flats, but they're so expensively constructed that nobody rents them, yeah. so they're pretty empty. That's number one. The number two headline news I would suggest is that there are two big issues that I'm hoping that in the days remaining we will address them. And that is about investments from within the region from Africa and our sure. respective countries. So if you want to bring in investments from uh, within the region, where is the settlement platforms for payments so that you can avoid the dollarization of uh, business investments mm. in Africa? Commissar, for example, used to have one. It's no longer working. I see Mr. Robert Oram of Africa Exim Bank is here. They're trying to do something. It will be interesting to hear his views when he speaks tomorrow, I think, on, 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 on Thursday. Now, there are a number of banks from across our country that are present, but they're present in so few countries. Yeah. So if you take any of those banks, then it's possible for you as an African producer or uh, in, importer to pay money in local currency to the bank because they have a branch in another bank. So if yeah. you don't have that, that's a challenge. And two more issues related to that is the whole question of the visa regime. The yeah. difficulty of African investors to travel to other African countries, even to see the business opportunities that are there. And then the question of the aviation market open skies agreement. Mm -hmm. So people are transiting. 
to different, you know, to Europe and other parts of the world before they can connect African countries. Yep. But then that leads me to the question of accountability. And I think my biggest illustration would be the fact that uh, my boss, the Secretary General, convened the high level political forum, multiple for a five of them, climate crisis, mm -hmm. on food systems, on the education summit. We're going to have the education summit later this month. And the idea is to governments to recognize the increased need for accountability to their publics yeah. to bring a whole of system approach to addressing the issues around their food systems. But secondly, to take an example from my host country, Rwanda. Rwanda has what he calls performance contracts in Mihigo. It cascades from the president down. Yeah. So all the excellent policies we've heard about today, in Rwanda you are accountable for delivering. They have public platforms that are not just about national consultations on yeah. food systems. These are ongoing platforms that public officials and citizens must engage with and to address. So Rwanda offers a model about how you cascade governance to the ground level, but also how you build up a whole of systems approach to implementation that can help address the issue of accountability to our publics, but also to ourselves as elected leaders. Mr. Ojeela, I would say that's more than just two headlines, but I think that was an excellent uh, contribution. Um, private capital and debt capital, are we being intentional about understanding and differentiated, differentiating the two? How do we better enable and support regional and continental investors? And of course, we've been talking about a whole of government, but surely we've got to be thinking even broader, broader visa regulations, open skies, where are we with that? And it comes back to promises made versus promises kept. And that's got to be a, a central part of the conversation that we have. Dr. Dunford, let me, let me come mm -hmm. to you as we begin to wrap. One of, the, one of the, 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 the intentions of this session was to also talk about new um, sources of finance mm -hmm. and where these might come from. So I'm keen to hear your thoughts on um, what, are, what can we expect in terms of new sources of finance, where could they be coming from, and more importantly, how do we tap <coughs> into them so that as we do, to Roy's earlier point, we do them with improving productivity at the same time. Over to you. Well, thank you very much for the question. And again, there have been a lot of really important ideas and important headlines uh, put forward. So honored to be a part of this esteemed panel. And I wanna bring us back to the crisis that we're facing here. Again, we've got uh, you know, recovering from COVID that has not yet been completed. We have climate change, the reality of which is getting starker and starker for African farmers. And now with the war in Ukraine, dramatically increasing prices. So this crisis really demands that we mobilize finance to support African governments, African farmers, and African private sectors to respond. Um, Roy mentioned the, you know, the productivity has not increased dramatically over our investments over the past decade, the past 15 years. It's a real problem. Productivity yields on the African continent are dramatically below what they are in other countries. And now we're seeing sort of the fragility of the food system that's dependent on importation uh, of basic staples just to survive. And I yeah. think, you know, we know that we need to fix the broader food system. We've heard about investments that we need to make across the food, uh, across the entire food system that are important. But what we're looking at right now at the African Development Bank is how we can support farmers right now to dramatically increase their production. There are technologies, seed technologies, that really uh, dramatically increase yields, enable production in areas that were too, too, too warm, too dry, et cetera. You know, all these technologies to enable farmers to adapt to climate change, increase their yields, but these technologies are not out at farmers at scale. We haven't invested in it, and we haven't really done what we needed to do to focus on getting these technologies out. So with this $1.5 billion African Emergency Food Production Facility that we are standing up at the African Development Bank, it was approved by our board on May 20th. Uh, we've already um, um, been able to roll out $1.1 billion of that um, through approved programs to governments to support them in their efforts to get these technologies, also fertilizer out to farmers. We think that we can uh, use this, uh, this crisis as a time to really mobilize that change that we've been seeking to get these technologies out at scale. So again, I think that this is a really important effort to focus on 
on an emergency basis, helping uh, farmers really be the change that we need to produce more food right now uh, on the continent. Um, <clears throat> I think that I'd also just like to talk about financing into the private sector. We know that agriculture is a business. We know that there's a dramatic financing gap across agriculture, uh, but especially in private sector in these small and medium enterprises. Yeah. Um, we've also launched um, the, the um, Agri-SME catalytic financing mechanism to really bring in uh, creative de-risking tools to really enable lending, increase lending into this sector. So I think that, again, across the value chain, across different, you know, with governments and also with private sector, ways to mobilize more funds now to meet this challenge of the crisis that's being faced. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dunford. And of course, for bringing back um, the small and medium-sized enterprise that can oftentimes be forgotten um, in these conversations and bringing them back front and center. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I do want to firstly thank my panel for um, taking on this very last shift. I don't even want to call it the graveyard shift, but certainly it is the last shift uh, of the evening. Can we please give them a big round of applause? Thank you very much. Thank you for your contributions. At this stage, to close us off um, by sharing uh, his um, reflections and extending his closing remarks, it's my absolute pleasure to invite Dr. Stefanos Fotu, um, Director at the UN Food Systems Coordination Hub. Dr. Fotu, I think I saw you. There you go. Let's give him a round of applause as he closes us off. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator, and I know I'm the only thing between you and your dinners, cocktails, or whatever, so let me try to take a little bit of time. So I want to, first of all, to reflect on all these beautiful things I've here today, and, and to say that um, I think I will be leaving this session much more hopeful that food system transformations are happening. Then they have started to happen in Africa. And I think this is a very big message, that Africa has become a leader on the way to the Food System Summit with such inclusive processes that they produce so many pathways, but now it's becoming a leader on implementation. I think all the panelists mentioned what is needed for this implementation to be augmented and accelerated. It's the coordination, it's the finance, it's the creation of the business case, it's the increasing of the budgets. And I think these are tangible solutions that they can happen. What is the role of the UN system coordination hub, on, uh, hub on, on, on supporting this? I'm very much privileged in the UN food system coordination hub because I work with a group of uh, excellent people, actually two groups of excellent people. One is my colleagues in the hub, the ones that they have been assigned by the agency supporting the hub, FAO, IFAD, WFP, um, WHO and the Executive Office of the Secretary General and DCO. But the second is the group of the food system national conveners that they make things happen. So we try to work together with these national conveners and provide them solutions from all the UN system and from the ecosystem of support. So what we have listened from them the last months and what are some messages that I would like to put here by, uh, as a closing remarks. The national conveners and the teams that they will make the food system transformation happen need specific, tangible solutions. They do have the spaces for dialogues, they do have the spaces for coordination, but they need to see from the donor community, they need to see from an international development assistant, concrete solutions that they will make the investment plans happen. The second thing is that a lot of coordination is still, I think, needed at the national level. A lot of coordination that you could bring together all the assets that they can support the national governments on implementing the pathways. And the third is that all of us in the international organizations, in the UN, in the very big think tanks, and uh, all the organizations that they are following up on the summit, we need to leave aside our organizational agendas and we need to support the agendas of the countries. So that would be, if you want, Madam Moderator, my, my message here that we need to, all of us together, to step, listen to the exact needs of the countries. We have done this in the UN Food System Coordination Hub and support them. Because I think that food system transformations could be the ticket 
of Africa for global leadership. And I'm very much convinced from what I hear today from the leaders and the practitioners that this will happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fortu. Food system transformation could be the ticket to see Africa taking uh, its position as a global leader in this particular area. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, as we close it off, allow me to thank you. Uh, for still being in the room at this hour and of course to say we're looking forward to your robust participation and engagement tomorrow. Uh, we'll be uh, moderating a few more sessions then. From myself, Nozipo Shabalala, it's always a privilege. Thank you for having me. This is the end of the session.